Hello everybody. We're going to look today at Christians and Christadelphians. It's the growth of the Christian church. My name is David Simpson. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. Christadelphianism. Now, there's a good chance that some of you have not even heard of this group, or if you have, you don't know much about them. And the reason I bring this to your attention is that a friend of mine who I have been sharing the gospel with and has been coming to church for the last couple of weeks has told me recently that he's been attending a Christadelphian ecclesia, which is a gathering of these people. Now, granted, this is a tiny group of individuals, probably not more than about 6,000 or so in the entire United States. But like other organizations, such as the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christadelphians claim to be the only true Christians, having rescued the Bible from centuries of misinterpretation. Now, it's interesting that all three of these groups began around the 1800s and all claim superior understanding of the Bible from that of historical Orthodox Christianity. The following statement is from their website, Christadelphian.org. Why should the Christadelphians deserve any more attention than other groups of believers, many claiming to be based on the Bible? Well, the answer is this. Their understanding of the teachings of the Bible are quite different from that of other denominations. The difference comes from the convictions of one Dr. John Thomas. He came to the conclusion that the teachings he was taught did not truly represent the true Christian faith, and he was persuaded that the truth must be sought only in the Bible, and he embarked upon a conscientious study of the Scriptures. He made no claim to any vision or personal revelation. It turns out that their understanding, I should say John Thomas's understanding of Scripture, is actually not that different from groups like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, who claim to just read the Bible. Problem is, they all get it wrong. Now, let's examine two of the Christadelphians' central teachings. You come to about the year 300, and by now, Christianity has swelled outside the walls of Jerusalem, outside the boundaries of Israel, and has now reached Rome, the headquarters of the Roman Empire, the then known world. The first, which all three of these non-Christian organizations have in common, is of course a denial of the Trinity, or the threeness of the persons within the one true being, God himself. Well, there was a very serious addition to the church at that time. Let me just quote from a little booklet, Jesus, God the Son, or the Son of God written by Mr. Fred Pierce. And he recounts that in the year 325, the Roman bishops met and they had their first general council at a place called Nicaea. And there they declared that the Son was from the beginning of the same nature as the Father. In other words, Jesus and God were one. Mr. Simpson points to the Council of Nicaea, big surprise there, as the beginning of this Trinitarian idea. <laughs> right out of Dan Brown and, and his theology, as if the pastors and leaders of the early church which were so, it was so difficult for them to come together to this central place to talk about doctrine, that these guys got together in a dark and smoky room and they tried to invent the most convoluted, confusing way of explaining God's nature that they could possibly come up with. <laughs> now let's deal with that one first. Error concerning the two natures of Jesus Christ is apparent from the very beginning of the early church. Paul's first letter to Timothy closes with these words, Guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the truth. Now, this knowledge being spoken of in the Greek here is gnosis, and we get Gnosticism from this word. And the Gnostics, which, which were a sect or a group way back in the, in the first century, taught that spirit or the, the immaterial is good and matter or the physical is bad. So it's no wonder that the Apostle John said in his first letter, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. 
From the time of the apostle, the church has always had to defend against false teachers. While the early church was trying to understand the one true God, remember the God of the Old Testament, through now the lens of the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, well, at the same time, heretics were teaching about the nature of God through monotheistic, you know, one God from the Old Testament and now a Gnostic impulse. There was a second century heretic by the name of Sibelius. And he taught that everything is a mode of God, or everything is of the same substance of God. I think it was called uh, modalistic monarchianism. And, and things have more or less of this substance of God. So Jesus was of the same substance of God, but so are the trees and the plants. Jesus just happened to have more, uh, 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 he had more of this substance than trees and plants do. Now, this teaching was soundly condemned in 267 at the Council of Antioch. The formula that was actually in use by the church, that Jesus was homo usius, homo, same, and usius of the same being or essence with the Father, right? He was of the same substance. Well, this was a problem now because of Sabellianism or this modalistic monarchianism. So the church replaced that term homoousius with homoousius, meaning of similar substance. This, however, became a problem because about this time along comes a guy by the name of Arius, who was bishop of Alexandria in the fourth century. And Arius was teaching that Jesus was the greatest creation of God, but not of the same substance, picking up on that newly adopted language of homoousius. And the church began using, that, that, that the church began using to correct the error of Sabellianism. So as a result, at the Council of Nicaea, the church went back to using the term homoousius to describe the nature of Jesus and the Father because the threat of Arianism was far greater than that of Sabellianism. <laughs> the church almost became Arian at that time. So you see, the Council of Nicaea and the creed that bears its name is the result of defending the most biblical sense of how God has revealed himself in the scriptures through the incarnation and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Arius and his followers were finally condemned as heretics at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and yet this serious error is alive and well in Christadelphianism. So you can see how man had now built a huge framework around Christianity which had not come from God at all. The long and short of that is the Trinity was born. And as the Romans took Christianity out to the countries, they brought with them to England and to other countries the message that God and Jesus were the same, that the Holy Spirit was to be worshipped, that Mary was the mother of God. And that is the reason why the majority of Christians today around the world believe in three gods. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And to be honest, my friends, it doesn't come from the Bible at all. It was invented and added by people. Okay, is that true that the doctrine of the Trinity was added by people at the Council of Nicaea and is nowhere taught in the Bible? Well, let's see where David Simpson uses uh, the Bible to make this claim. Let's now have a brief look at the scriptures. Three passages from the Gospel of John. Is there a Trinity? Is God really the same as Jesus and Jesus as God? Then answered Jesus and said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. And to me that says that Jesus takes his orders and his authority from God, not being God himself. John chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ has his teaching given to him by God. I'll read one more. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. And just the very end of verse 28. My father is greater than I. Now, those are very compelling verses, David. However, let's go back to the beginning of John's gospel, shall we? What does it say? Well, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
So drawing from Genesis 1, of course, John the Apostle is telling us that whoever this word is, he was in the beginning with God, showing distinction, and he himself was God, showing sameness or homoousius. Now, if you go to the 14th verse of the first chapter of John, he tells us that this word is someone who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, go a little bit farther in the first chapter, and we read in verse 29, the next day he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Well, that's funny, because John the Baptist was born before Jesus. So, the verses that David quoted must be understood in light of the larger context of John's Gospel, which declares that the Son of God, the Word, the Logos, is indeed God the Son. So you see how far Christianity, brought by the Romans so many years ago, is different from Bible teaching. Jesus is not God. God is greater than Jesus. So I can't believe in the Trinity let alone what all the other Christian churches teach. Most people who reject the Trinity do so because they fail to understand that the man Jesus, and he was true man, born of a woman, at a particular time in human history, has an additional divine nature which is united to his human nature. This is clear, not from some specific passage of Scripture that says Jesus has a divine nature, but from the totality of all the Scriptures. And here's just one example. Here's an Old Testament passage that will connect to the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. And it goes on to talk about the seraphim uh, covering their faces and they're calling out to him, holy, holy, holy. And the foundations of the threshold, uh, they shook and a voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, who is it that Isaiah is seeing in this vision? Well, Yahweh, right? Jehovah, the one true and living God. Now, go to John chapter 12. Remember the gospel that David is using to try to deny the Trinity and pick it up at verse 36. We read there, While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah may be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And here it is in verse 41. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Well, the he there and the him there and the glory there is referring to Jesus and referring back to Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah saw the Lord of hosts high and lifted up. John is saying in no uncertain terms that the King and Lord of hosts that Isaiah saw in his vision is none other than Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. In other words, before the eternal Son took on human flesh. Now, I'm not saying that the teaching of one monotheistic God who is at the same time three distinct yet united persons and the teaching that one of those persons of this monotheistic God took upon himself a human nature in the womb of Mary through the hovering of the Holy Spirit is easy to understand. It's not. But I'm saying that these two doctrines are clearly taught throughout the books of the Old and more and more the New Testament. The early church fathers, well, like Polycarp back in, I don't know, about, about year 100, Bishop of Smyrna, he said, 
O Lord God Almighty, I bless you and glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom be glory to you with him and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. See, he had no problem articulating the triune nature of God. And throughout the centuries, it has been only the orthodox understanding of the nature of God. It's been the only one. But alas, everybody got it wrong. Everybody got it wrong until John Thomas took his Bible and read it for himself. You know, there's nothing more dangerous than an open Bible and a person who is willing to disconnect themselves from the historic Orthodox Christian faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. Now, this is history. The point which concerns us is this. A very interesting date is the early 1800s, 1832 to be precise, and a man called John Thomas, on a boat going to America, was in a huge storm and vowed that if he got off in the dry land safely, he would read the Bible for himself and try to find the true message. But my friends, it doesn't matter at all what our name is. It doesn't matter at all what you call your little group or what you call yourself. There's only one thing that matters, and that is the message of the Bible. And this is where we turn to the Bible again. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Lord Jesus Christ is here saying that the only possible way to come to God is through himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is a biblical statement, but you must have the right Jesus. Get Jesus wrong and you're trying to come to God by another way, a way that will not save you. And for those of us who have been baptized and now try to live in Jesus, a completely new life starts. And then when Jesus returns, he claims us as his own. Ah, yes, that is another error of the Christadelphians. The absolute necessity of water baptism by immersion, in their church, of course, in order to be saved. Now, don't get me wrong. Baptism is necessary. <laughs> We're told to be baptized. But it's not absolutely necessary in order to be saved, as the penitent thief on the cross, who was next to Jesus, who was saved at the very last moment of his life, uh, completely uh, discounts. So we, we don't have to worry about that one. Christadelphians believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is also the Son of Man through being born of Mary. Yes, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit who hovered over Mary. So he gets his human nature from Mary. He, he referred to himself as the Son of Man more than any other designation. But go to Daniel chapter 7. What does it say about the Son of Man? It says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Jesus had to have our human nature to be like us so that his sacrifice would be a real meaningful victory over this human nature. Jesus had a true human nature, but a human nature that was not tainted or polluted by Adam's sin. And this is denied by Christadelphians. They, they, they say this, because of his human nature, Jesus experienced minor illnesses just as we do. It therefore follows that if he did not die on the cross, he would have died anyways of old age. In view of this, Jesus needed to be saved from death by God. Well, folks, this makes no sense. Death is the penalty for sinning against God, beginning in the garden uh, uh, with the fall of Adam and Eve. If Jesus needed to be saved from death, then that would mean that Jesus himself was a sinner. And, and not just that he had a sinful nature but didn't actually sin. If Jesus was under the Adamic curse, then he would be guilty by virtue of Adam's original sin imputed to him, and he couldn't be a perfect substitute for others who had sinned because he'd have to pay for his own sinful nature. The Christadelphians go on to say, God gave us his own son who had our sinful flesh with all the promptings to sin which we have. <laughs> 
Unlike every other man, though, Christ overcame every temptation, although he had the possibility of failure and sinning just as much as we do. And they use Romans 8.3 to describe Christ having sinful flesh. Well, that's an utter misunderstanding of Romans 8.3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. You see, Jesus was truly human according to his human nature. He was fully human according to his human nature, except for sin. He was like us in every way except for sin. Look at Hebrews 7. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, who of course were sinners, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this... Because he, because he died once for all when he offered up himself. If he had been different from us in this respect, it could have been said that it was easier for him to overcome sin because he wasn't like us and so diminish the value of his sacrifice. The value of his sacrifice. <laughs> now this is where John Thomas's deficient understanding of scripture is so apparent. Look up the term without blemish in a concordance, and you will find it over and over again in relation to the offerings that were acceptable to God in the Old Testament. All these sacrifices could only look forward to the ultimate sacrifice that would truly atone for and propitiate the wrath of God because of human sinfulness. John 1.29, remember, the next day he saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then go to 1 Peter 1, 17. If you address his Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. Whose blood? The blood of Christ. And then go to Hebrews 9.14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All right, let's, let's, let's wrap this up and, and let's break it down this way. Jesus had to be a true and righteous man because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which had sinned against him should make satisfaction for that sin. But if Jesus had himself a sinful nature, then he was himself a sinner and therefore could not satisfy God's wrath for others. Romans 5.15 says, But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, that is Adam, that many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. We go back to Isaiah, it's 53 uh, in that chapter. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Do you see that? Do you see the, the substitutionary action of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You see, Jesus had to have a divine nature as well. That by the power of his divine nature, which was united to his human nature even in death. Now, his, 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 his divine nature didn't die, remember. His human nature died, but that divine nature was still united to that human nature. That he might bear in his human nature the infinite weight of God's wrath and thereby purchase for us salvation and also restore us to the place of being declared righteous before the Father. Acts 2.24, this is great. 
God raised him up, that is Jesus, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that death could hold him. Acts 20:28. 20, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Whose blood? Jesus Christ, his blood. So we know that Jesus is that mediator the one person who is truly God and also a true and righteous man. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is freely given to us for complete redemption and righteousness. It is this Jesus who is God and man in one person that you must believe in in order to be saved. And I'll leave you with Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved.